Charles for inviting me. Thank you very much. As a well-known fact that some elements of the Islamic Republic of Iran exhibit anti-Semitic tendencies. To better understand the rise of these tendencies, I would like us to see them in historical perspective and briefly offer some four factors as background to the emergence. Excuse me. Factor number one. Could you speak just a trifle bit slower? As I listen, we'll be a bit slower. <laughs> <laughs> Factor number one, I'd like to address. In the AC 51, Iran was controlled by Islam. The approach of Islam and Muslims for the Jews was based on various factors. One is Muhammad's attitude. I can say it. One Muhammad's attitude was the Jews at first tried to defend them, later attacking them, and extend to read that. <laughs> 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 Massacring the men of the third one. Two Quranic perceptions. The Quran uh, includes positive statements on the Jews, but also negative ones. Three hadith or traditions and perceptions of the Jews, some positive but also often negative ones. Four polemical literature against the Jews, including different uh, arguments. A. Viewing the Hebrew Bible as a divine text that had been abrogated in the face of more complete and perfect, uh, perfect revelations. B. The Hebrew Bible as forged by the Jews. C. The Hebrew Bible was seen as predicting the rise of Muhammad and Islam. A fifth element, certain precedents that developed during the conquest of Islam and that were adopted by the schools of law in Islam. All above five issues are quoted nowadays, as we could say in the morning, very much remembered, cherished, and taught uh, to the next uh, following generation. The Jews, as well as some other religious minorities, and this is important to keep in mind, recognize as the people of the book uh, meriting protection or Rema in exchange for the acceptance of certain conditions that demonstrated uh, the Muslim, that demonstrated their dis submission to Muslim rule, their recognition of Islam superiority, and their dishonor. The Rimis or the Rima consisted of a set of stipulations which included the prohibition of constructing new houses of worship, no finding on saddles, the Rimis were obligated to wear clothes that differed from those of Muslims. Still, compared to their status under the Sasanians, the status of the Jews improved under Islam. Jews now receive protection dictated by the Sharia, the law of Islam. This is the map of Iran, this is the map of Iran in Safavid times. The arrival of the Safavid dynasty to power over Iran in the early 16th century marked a turning point in the history of Iran in general and in the history of its religious minorities in particular. Under the Safavids, Shiism became the state uh, religion. In the like manner of Sunni Islam, Shiism viewed the people of the book residing under Islam as demons. Nevertheless, Shiism has uh, some unique uh, character, character, characteristics in this regard. A hallmark of Shi treatment of religious minorities is the concept of Nejasat or Najasa impurity. According to this concept, religious minorities are among whom the Jews were perceived as impure, whose touch defies the Shi believer. This concept of impurity became ubiquitous and had a tremendous impact on the Jews' lives and daily interaction with larger uh, Shi society. It helped segregating the Jews and was used as a pretext uh, for barring them entrance to the local marketplaces, bazaars of certain cities. Other issues are uh, of uh, food. Some is would argue that the food produced by Jews is allowed for Muslims uh, to consume, whereas Shiites would argue that only specific items of food, such as fruits, vegetables, grains, etc., are to be consumed by Shiites. Another element is the question of uh, marriage. Whereas Sunnis would marry, whereas Sunnis would allow a Muslim man to marry a Jewess, for instance, Shiites would argue that this is allowed only in a certain type of marriage, temporary marriages, Muta is called, many of which have a kind of an inferior status in Shiite law. Indeed, these, con indeed, in these concepts apply to the people of the book at large, and this is again something to keep in mind, not only to the Jews. 
still Jews, like other religious minorities, are seen as inferior to Muslims, so we have to keep this in mind. Factor number two in my presentation. Moving from legal concepts pertaining to the Jews to the real life situation, <coughs> I should say that I should say that the real life situation of the Jews in Raja in the Safavid times, 16th, 17th, 18th centuries, was usually uh, very bad. Actually, due to different factors, not only Shiite perceptions but also economic tensions and political reasons. By the end of the 18th century, in 1796, a new dynasty, the Raja dynasty. Uh, took over Iran and reigned supreme over much of Iran. Under the early Rajas, in, in between 1796 and 1848, Jews suffered from uh, uh, occasional persecution and regular abuse, including blood libel accusations. At times, Jews were forcibly converted to Islam, as, as was the case with the conversion of the Jewish community of Mashhad in 1839. The Jews of Mashhad led crypto Jewish life for generations to come. I should mention in this context a certain inheritance, Shiite inheritance law which was very common at that time, according to which if Jews and Muslims are heirs of a person and this person dies, the Muslims uh, take the entire inheritance. Indeed, all these, other, indeed, all these uh, uh, persecutions, abuse, and laws apply to other people in the book at large. Still, in some cases, the Jews uh, seem to be regarded as inferior to all the others, and we have this quote here, uh, which is a quote of one of the Shah's uh, physician's statement. The Jews are, in the scale of God's creatures, the lowest of white beings. They are the leprosy of creation. They are the degree above dogs. We kill a Jew and say no blood, no blood is spilled. They are the abandoned of Allah. Who cares for a Jew, more or less? Some change in the legal status of the daily uh, situation of the Jews can be uh, discerned. Uh, from the latter part of the 19th century onward, largely due to foreign intervention. Still, Jews continue to suffer from, from disabilities uh, after they were removed from other religious minorities, and this is a point to really highlight. Meaning, Jews continue to suffer. Indeed, in many respects, they are similar to other religious minorities, their status, their position, their, their real life situation, but in other respects, they would suffer, and they, they did suffer much more than the rest of uh, the communal community much more than the rest of the religious minorities in Iran. In 1873, we can speak about uh, the equality granted to the, to the Jews specifically, but reality had uh, a different course, and indeed, uh, in the latter decades of the 19th century and early 20th century, Jews would be, uh, continue to be uh, uh, attacked, harassed, cases of violence, attacks against pogroms, literally in the city of Shiraz, in Kermanshah, and other places. The areas of the 20th century uh, were impacted by Iran's first revolution, the Constitutional Revolution, in between 1906 and 1911. The enactments of the years uh, of those years revealed some changes on the part of for the for part of the religious minorities, including the Jews. The supplementary, supplementary fundamental laws of October 7, 1907, opens with this following momentous declaration: "Quote the people of the Iranian Empire." Uh, to enjoy equal rights before the law, end quote. This was indeed a major break uh, for the Islamic view of legal rights of non-Muslims. Nevertheless, uh, other enactments of the same time period were, period were less forthcoming. Only Muslims, for instance, could be ministers. Jews, among other religious, religious minorities, were not completely welcomed to Iranian society. And indeed, onslaughts and, uh, continued again in Shiraz, Kermanshah, and other places. Addressing the Jews' space in Iranian eyes, we so far briefly mentioned two factors. One, the attitude of Islam, mainly Shiite Islam towards the Jews. Two, the actual approach of Iranian society towards the Jews from the 16th century to the early 20th, 20th uh, century. Both have a long-standing impact on contemporary attitudes towards the Jews and Judaism in Iran. Entering the 20th uh, century, two further factors should be borne in mind. That's the third factor, the introduction of European concepts of anti-Semitism. The fourth factor is different political uh, reasons or factors among which the establishment of Israel, and I'd like to speak about the third factor and then the fourth uh, factor. As shown by uh, Sorubi and some other scholars, secular nationalism was one aspect of Western thought that began attracting some Iranians already during the 19th century. Secular nationalism found expression, expression in two different uh, directions. One a liberal one, one a uh, liberal, the other 
was held by some intellectuals that highlighted the pure Iranian elements in their identity. Arabs and Islam that were seen as primarily foreign reasons underneath Iran's decline were regarded, according to this line, as Semite, whereas Europeans uh, and their civilizations were seen as alien. The followers of this trend in Iran read the linguistic divisions of languages into Turkic, Semitic, and Indo-European uh, languages in racial terms, which allowed them to dissociate themselves from the Semitic and the Turkic stocks, quote unquote. Such concepts found their currency under the Pahlavi regime. Reza Shah Pahlavi, founder of the Pahlavi dynasty, was first and foremost committed to modernizing Iran, constructing, constructing railroads and factories, enlarging the bureaucracy, strengthening the army, and investing in the education, agriculture, and industry of the country. The ideology for this enterprise was nationalism. Nationalism came at the, at the expense of Islam, and this was good for the Jews because now, much more than before, Jews were perceived as Iranians, whose religious persuasion was their own private affair. This process, however important, should not be overrated, as simultaneously the Reza Shah's regime increased the racial awareness of the Iranian people by emphasizing and glorifying pre-Islamic uh, times. Some Iranian intellectuals and authors, occasionally under the influence of uh, Artur de Gobineau, the French one, emphasize the Iranian extraction of the Iranians, thereby asserting that those who are not Aryans, such as the Jews, were not including in the, were not included in the reawakening awakening nation of Iran. Furthermore, the Iranian regime approached Nazi Germany. From 1936 onward, hundreds of Germans disguised as tourists arrived annually in Iran. German lecturers, teachers, and experts, uh, experts came to Iran to teach. Nazi lecturers were sent to speak on the supremacy of the Iranian race. In 1936, the Nazi, Nazi regime declared that the Iranians are pure aliens, thereby exempting them from the Nuremberg uh, laws. In 1937, the head of the Iranian parliament, the Svendiari, even visited Hitler. By 1940, Germany's share in Iran's foreign trade had, had reached some 45.5% more than any other foreign country. Iran became, Iran became the refuge place for the, for the poor Nazi premier of Iraq, Oshida al Dayalani, and for Haj Amin Hosseini, the Mufti of Jerusalem. By 1946, one expert of Iranian studies would argue that to some extent the Jewish situation was then worse than in the past. And indeed, this racist rhetoric could only invite pressure on the head of the Jews. Some anti-Semitic uh, anti outbursts were uh, seen. For instance, in Rash, Passover in 1946, in the northern community of Rash, uh, a blood libel accusation was seen. Similar allegations were made in 1947 and 48 in Persian newspapers. Following the ousting of Reza Shah in 1941, parties came into being, some of them with racist tendencies and overt anti-Semitic ideology. I'm moving to the fourth factor. In the latter part of the 20th century, anti-Jewish feelings were harbored, in addition to the above factors, due to political reasons. The establishment of Israel on supposed Muslim lands caused, some, uh, caused Muslims at large, including Shiites, to get involved in the question of Palestine in all sorts of ways. One example is in 1947, Ayatollah Abu Hazem Hashami called upon Muslims to join their brethren in fighting in Palestine. There were growing Arab Israeli conflict uh, influence in other ways. The conflict was seen by some Muslims through religious lenses as a conflict between Muslims and Jews, Islam and Judaism. In this context, Jews and Judaism were criticized and defamed as constituting an old problem already from the rise of Islam. Regarding the teachings of the, of the past, as a role model, a role model, an example for the present, these Muslims read their own earlier sources, Quran, Hadith, and so on, in the light of the present conflict. As a matter of fact, the contemporary concern over Palestine and Israel leads this branch of Muslims to distort the past. In reading the Quran, they would focus, for instance, only on verses that depict the Jews in a negative way. Even serious Muslim, uh, Muslim uh, religious scholars, uh, such as the late Alama Muhammad Hussein Tabatabai, are well known. Ayatollah, who died in 1981, occasionally connect between the Jews of Mosaic times and all of Muhammad's time and the Jews of 20th century, uh, of the 20th century. Following Quranic verses, Tabatabai deals in his 20 volume Quranic commentary with the Jews. In some places, he does not address the Jews mentioning the Quran only, but moves on to offer his thoughts on contemporary Jews, thereby drawing a line between the past Jews' negative characteristics and that of contemporary Jews. Reading the present into the past, 
uh, that is distorting the past is demonstrated in the uh, recently produced film in Iran, Yusuf Hayambar, the Prophet Joseph. The story of the Prophet Joseph is dreams, his imprisonment, and later uh, feminists in Egypt. In one episode, the sons of Jacob fight a Canaanite boy over the Islam. Jacob then rebukes his sons, stating that before the children of Israel, that is his own children, came to Canaan, there were in that land of Canaan other people who owned the land. This seems to be a latent reference to the contemporary conflict of the land. Furthermore, Judah, the forefather of the Jews, is depicted in a very negative light in this film. He's the mastermind behind Joseph's selling. He beats him up pretty really severely, and he never fully regrets his supposed misdeeds with uh, Joseph. At the end of the movie, the producers of the movie put in Judah's mouth a sentence that indicates that the children of, the children of Israel, that is the children of Jacob, will, call, will be called Jews, thereby making a connection between Judah's negative image throughout the film and the later Jewish people. I to, uh, what, what did the Khomeini say about the Jews? Before the revolution, he used to say that the Jews were uh, used uh, to challenge Islam from uh, its inception, actually. The Jews disseminated the uh, anti-Muslim Okadana, or that the Jews want to take over the econ economy of the world. All these uh, elements obviously are well-known anti-Semitic arguments. In his later statements, he made a distinction between Jews and Zionists. Jews are protected under Islamic would argue, whereas Zionists are attacked by Khomeini. This distinction is sometimes, but not always, taken by Iranian officials. Now, as we know, uh, we all know that the Islamic Republic of Iran is really anti-Israel, the, the how was anti-Israeli feelings and statements, etc., etc. The question is, what's the connection between that and anti-Semitism? I'm sure my Professor Litvak is going to elaborate on that, and I'm actually using some of his own writings in this context. So I'll do it very briefly. Whereas Israel, like many, whereas Israel, like many other communities or uh, countries, should not be immune of criticism, Iranian attacks on Israel are at least partly based on anti-Semitic arguments. For instance, uh, the Jews are seen as exhibiting enmity towards Islam since Islam's uh, early days. This is what Khomeini said. And no wonder that they would do it now, today, with the state of Israel. That is. The regime would attack, or the Iranian government would attack Israel and argue that this is a kind of a characteristic of the Jews. They used to do it from the earliest days of Islam, and this is indeed a kind of an anti Semitic argument. Let us move to really overt, clearly, in the anti Semitic statements uh, in Iran. So we have different kinds of evidence of anti Semitic and anti Semitism in Iran. In the slide, you see down, you can really see uh, the uh, different books that were presented in an uh, international book exhibition in Germany in 2005 by Iran. One of them is The Protocols of the Elders of Zion, and the other one is a book by Henry Ford. The Protocols of the Elders of Zion were published in Iran several times, in the 1930s and 40s, in the early 60s, in the, in the late 70s, and in various editions since the establishment of the Islamic Republic in English and in Persian. The Protocols was also published in newspapers and publications. I have a list uh, of these. The uh, emphasis on the protocols and the Jews' attempt to take over Iran and dominate the world is also seen, as well as to plan genocide, to plan the genocide humanity is seen also in an Iranian TV series called The Secret of Armageddon, about which I was uh, informed in a, a certain memory uh, piece. Two, beyond the literature, some figures disseminate anti Semitic ideas in their speeches and public uh, lectures. Dr. Hassan Abbasi is an Iranian political analyst. The head of the Center of Doctrinal Analysis in the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps, as well as a theoretician in the office of the Supreme Leader of Iran, Ali Khamenei, and for some time in the past, uh, an advisor to President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. In some of his lectures of recent years, Dr. Abbasi argues that various empires of the past were controlled by the Jews. More specifically, he says that the Jews controlled the Achaemenid Empire, as learned from the biblical uh, book of, es of Esther. Two of the most important figures uh, in the empire were Jews, Esther and Mordechai. Dr. Abbasi emphasizes that by the Jews' story in the school of Esther, Esther there occurred a massacre, that Leami says, of some 75,000 Iranians at the hands of the Jews. Holocaust in, he says in Persian. This is the meaning of a Holocaust. Abbasi argues that the Jews, Esther and Mordechai, pushed the king to attack Athens as they, as they uh, exactly as they pushed the Mongols to attack 
Islam. About anti-Semitic themes, we just mentioned uh, briefly the theme about Joseph as well as the secret of Armageddon. I'm not going to dwell on that again. A fourth element is uh, internet publications. Following Ahmadinejad's rise in 2005, there are an increasingly seen in the, in the blog sphere Iranian anti-Semite blogs and internet publications. Some of these blogs focus on Muslim religious arguments and sources. According to Hamid Tehrani, who did a nice job on that, <coughs> some of these bloggers cite a single verse of the Quran. They love citing a verse that we already saw in the morning, in, 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 in 582, chapter 5 in the Quran, verse 82. That Tajidana Ashadun Nas Adawatan Liladina Amanu Yahud. You are going to surely find that the worst enemies to uh, the believers are the Jews and the polytheists, and they love quoting the, uh, this verse time and again. Jews and polytheists are the worst enemies, yes. Another blog finds hidden Jews and argues that Muammar Gaddafi of Libya is a Jew. He's responsible for the disappearance of Musa Sadr, the Lebanese Shiite leader. Obviously, we all know about this accusation against Ahmadinejad as being a, a Jew, and this is a kind of a medieval accusation against certain uh, Arab figures that, or Muslim figures that one party didn't really like. Already in the 8th century, the famous al Mufanna, a Muslim writer, is being accused of having some Jewish origins. A lot is said against uh, the Hollywood uh, movies in some of these blogs. One internet article, I have it here with me, says that Hollywood does the Yaudas. Hollywood is in the hands of the Jews. It specifies names of numerous actors and producers who are, according to this piece, Jews. One blog uh, says that Harry Potter books and movies try to give a positive image of witchcraft. The blogger claims that it may be contrary to it, that witchcraft is uh, contrary to Islamic Christianity, but is attractive to Jews. Another blog argues that Mickey Mouse movies depict him in a positive way because the Jews were used to be seen in Europe as rats. So in order to improve their image, meaning Mickey Mouse movies were produced. The fifth element of which everybody knows, I guess, we have different kinds of government uh, pronouncements. Following the line of some of his predecessors, uh, most notably uh, the Supreme Leader of uh, Iran, Khamenei, and in common with the certain blogs, President Ahmadinejad has emphasized time and again on different podiums that the mass killing of the millions of Jews during the Second World War, the Holocaust is a myth. In November 2006, Iran hosted a convention that officially wished to examine whether indeed millions of Jews had been killed. In uh, November 2009, Mohammed Ali Ramin, a Holocaust denier, was appointed to Vice Minister of Culture. He said that the Jews are reason for the maladies of the world and that, that, and that Hitler was Jewish. Most recently, in early August 2010, an internet site in Persian, translated to other languages, this is it, uh, presents the Holocaust cartoons, which is based on a 2008 book, 2008 book of cartoons. I'm just concluding. To conclude, anti-Semitic feelings and imagery were not always common in Iran. 20th and 21st uh, expressions uh, of anti-Semitism are, are effective of four elements. One, certain limited, uh, specifically Shiite perception, perceptions of the people of the book. Two, it's reflective of past treatment of and denigrating approach and imagery towards the Jews among other religious minorities, seeing them as filthy liars and worthy of trust and more. Three, it's reflective of introduction of European racist, especially anti-Semitic ideology. Four, it's reflective of political concerns over the fate of, the, of Muslim lands in their facing what is regarded as, a, regarded as an imperialist onslaught on Islam. And it's also reflective specifically of political concerns over the fate of Palestine and Israel. Anti-Semites in Iran consist of some government officials, Ahmadinejad for instance, but also some of the adversaries from the protest movement I have some names here, as well as certain members of society as seen in their blogs. That is, anti-Semitism is apparently a rather broad phenomenon in Iran. Nevertheless, not all Iranians espouse such beliefs. Some of them view the Holocaust as a fact, as well as reject common anti-Semitic themes. Thank you very much. Uh, the roots of modern Muslim anti-Semitism Jews and the traditional concept of tolerance in Islam. As a uh, professor emeritus who is an absolute troglodyte when it comes to technology, I'm absolutely overwhelmed that everything that I see on this particular table 
uh, I would have uh, settled for a simple lamp by which to read my paper, but uh, I guess I'll have to make do uh, with what I have here. Now, as I have had the course to remark time and again, there is much confusion that marks current thinking about the long history of Jewish-Muslim relations. What is referred to as Arab anti-Semitism, both within official academic circles, as well as in the public imagination, is all too often the result of linking Arab-Muslim attitudes and behavior with a vocabulary of ideas and actions more common to Christian Europe. The tendency of certain political leaders and groups in Israel, and even more so in the diaspora, if not in this very room, to reduce all anti-Jewish and anti-Israel sentiment and sentiment and behavior in the Arab world to a single anti-Semitic paradigm closely linked to that of the West is at best misleading because it does not give sufficient weight to traditional Muslim attitudes towards Jews and Judaism. On the other hand, it is even more misleading to think that all negative Arab-Muslim responses to Jews and Judaism, including patently anti-Semitic imports from Tsarist Russia and Nazi Germany, have been occasioned only by Zionist attempts to establish a Jewish state in the very midst of the Arab-Muslim world, and that prior to the creation of Israel, Jews settled in Islamic lands always lived an idyllic life, and that they and their faiths were always enthusiastically respected by their Arab neighbors, so much so that in the best of times, the Jews of Islam enjoyed what has been described as a golden age, rooted in expressions of mutual acceptance and marked by tolerant policies on behalf of the Muslim authorities. Now, one could certainly argue, and with considerable justification, that Jewish life among the Muslims was, for the most part, preferable to that of Jews living among the Christians in Europe, that is, before Jewish emancipation took root in the more liberal nations of the West, beginning at the end of the 18th century. But the notion of a so-called golden age of tolerance and cultural achievement experienced widely by the Jews of Islamic lands is actually a phantasmagoric view of the Jewish past invented largely by 19th century German Jews seeking a model for acceptance among the Gentiles by retaining some semblance of their own Jewish identity. If one considers the broad distribution of Jews throughout the abode of Islam and the long history of Jews in Islamic lands, the truth is a good deal more complicated. The long history of Jewish-Muslim relations and the manner in which Jews and Muslims sharing the same wakan or homeland perceive one another and their religions is a subject that has already been addressed here and will no doubt come up time and again in our discussions. A good deal also has been said and even more written about anti-Jewish sentiments sprinkled throughout Muslim scripture and other Muslim writings. What I intend to do in the point what is left of my 20 minutes is to turn to the very notion of tolerance and how it is understood in classical Islamic tradition and time permitting I'll mention how current Muslim reformers, familiar with and admiring of European enlightenment values, have sought to find equivalents for Western notions of freedom, pluralism, mutually respected dialogue, and the like in Muslim scripture, a quest which, alas, has not gained much traction beyond certain circles of Muslim intellectuals familiar with the West and Western audiences seeking a safe ground for a possible rapprochement with the Islamic world. As of late, those who live in the liberal democracies of the Western world, as it were, a world in which religious belief has been buffeted by secularism, if not an outright denial of religious faith, the meaning of tolerance originally indicating the bearing of a burden or the capacity to endure a dangerous substance has been expanded to include putting up with actions, people's beliefs that one does not like or approve of or even vehemently opposes. One may therefore tolerate heretics even when intolerant of the heresies they espouse. Put somewhat differently, tolerance has come to apply over time the recognition that others 
are fully entitled to the free expression of their own views and the right to practice their own faith and or politics in accordance with their beliefs, provided that such views and practices do not compromise the codes of behavior that are declared the moral bedrock of our own liberal society. More recently, those who claim liberal values have extended the meaning of tolerance still further. They now equate tolerance with an attempt to avoid being judgmental of other cultures. Liberals of this sort are inclined to eschew moral condescension, especially regarding the most egregious, except regarding the most egregious displays of uncivilized behavior. For example, as a matter of principle, one can accept the various practices of courtship and marriage among different elements of our larger and all-embracing liberal culture, but one can hardly be expected to tolerate honor killings accepted as normative in other societies, a practice brought to liberal democracies by immigrants from abroad, or to choose a more pertinent example in societies such as ours, one tolerates, indeed, at times one even encourages protest demonstrations against established authority, but not behavior which imperils the civilities required to maintain proper law and order, let alone endanger human life. The liberal ideal of tolerance today is the mark of a society that has more or less embraced a live and let live attitude, a view based most recently on a progressive view of history in which different cultures seek to accommodate one another in an ever-shrinking world, as if the moral guidelines of the emerging world will be in harmony with its economic forces as a matter of course. Responsible scholars attuned to differences that are caused by time and place are likely to note that current Western definitions of tolerance broaden considerably the semantic field of those Arabic words long employed by traditional Muslims when they speak of tolerance. Now, it may seem quaint that some scholars are still concerned with understanding Arabic, especially the technical vocabulary used to describe tolerance, but if one wishes to truly understand how different cultures perceive the world and one another at any given moment, it's best to determine what words used in common actually convey in the languages of these respective cultures. In classical as well as modern Arabic, tolerance is usually expressed by akhtimal, the preferred usage, or samha, samaha, and basama. As in English and European languages, akhtimal equaling tolerance is the act of being able to bear a burden. For the great Arabic lexicographers, this included a capacity to absorb annoyance with someone's insulting or presumptuous behavior, and by extension, patience or forbearance with someone or something. By no means does Iftimal imply, as it does to modern Arabic speakers embracing Western notions of tolerance, treating those with whom one profoundly disagrees or the views they hold, especially unbelievers and their beliefs, with proper respect, that is, without resorting to moral pronouncements about the parties concerned, while avoiding as a matter of good faith any condescending, insulting, or hurtful language. Muslims have absolute license, if not an obligation, to point out the errors of the unbelievers and did so with predictable regularity. Samtha, Samah, and Samaha take a rather different route before becoming <coughs> synonymous with Western notions of tolerance. Based on an Arabic root that conveys generosity, the semantic field of these classical Arabic words was extended to mean lightening the load of a legal obligation and acting in an easy and gentle manner. From there, we come to modern Arabic forbearance and beyond that to a sense of tolerance more closely linked to the Western sense of the word, hence the expression, Islam is the tolerant religion of Hanifiya Samaha. But Samaha conveyed to pre-modern readers an altogether different concept. When Muslim scholars referred to Islam as a Hanifiya Samaha, they meant Islam is the lenient, or if you prefer, the flexible religion in Arabic within Muslim. That is, a religion which does not impose excessively arduous practices upon believers, perhaps 
as distinct from the stringent demands placed on Jews by their religious authorities, a polemical theme expressed in the Quran. As regards leniency or flexibility in Islamic law, one may turn, for example, to various rules concerning ritual washing, an act required of Muslims before they say their five daily prayers. When Muslims travel in barren regions, as Bedouins often did, sand may be used to replace water. Similarly, when beset by sickness or difficult travel conditions, Muslims are allowed to postpone the long fast of Ramadan in which they are enjoined to abstain from eating and drinking between sunrise and sunset to the following month, and one can multiply these examples many times over. The point is, when describing Islam as a religion of Samaha, the interpretive fingers of the traditional and modern hands are not of equal length. As understood by traditional Muslims, Samaha did not signify the toleration of other religions, let alone sympathetic consideration of the beliefs of others, as if all communities were meant to thrive in a free marketplace of ideas. To be sure, there are limitations to any analysis of interfaith relations rooted largely, if not exclusively, in texts written and read mostly by learned scholars seeking to recover the views of Muslims in early times Theologically grounded Islamicists tend to focus on materials in the Quran and its commentaries on Islamic legal traditions and on early works of Islamic jurisprudence. No doubt, some observers will argue that this treatment of tolerance and coercion reflects these theoretical concerns of religious scholars rather than the actual conduct of daily relations among different faith communities. But the sum and substance of these earlier discussions, which often expressed negative attitudes towards faiths other than Islam, was reproduced in more accessible literary text and filtered down to the general populace through an omnipresent oral tradition and folklore, which seemingly formed the conventional wisdom of the times towards Jews and Judaism. There is then ever so much we can learn about interfaith relations from literary sources provided that we pose the kinds of questions that open rather than close scholarly debates. Above all, we are obliged to ask, what does the anti-Jewish bias so well defined and so ubiquitous among Muslims reveal about daily contacts and patterns of interfaith behavior? Put somewhat differently, did the anti-Jewish bias expressed in literary texts and oral traditions adversely affect relations between Jews and Muslims? And if so, how was this adverse relationship perceived by both parties? For example, can we really speak of Muslim authorities coercing Jews to compromise their beliefs and time-honored practices? But most dramatically, did Jews feel any significant pressure to abandon their faith even though early on, Islamic law offered them, and also Christians, the status of protected minorities. Broadly speaking, the Quran was understood to prohibit pressuring other faiths to convert when it states there is no coercion in religion, like Kraft al Din, an injunction that remains binding uh, Muslims until this very day. As forced conversion was, in fact, rare, it never was in the Middle Ages, nor is it now, an overriding and continuous concern for living Jews in the abode of the believers. And the emphasis is on overriding and consistent. Interestingly enough, the Quranic pronouncement, there is no coercion in religion, was intended at first not for the Jews or for the Christians, but for Muhammad's polytheist opponents at a time when the newly declared prophet was in no position to impose his faith on his idolatrous Meccan kinsmen. It was, in effect, a concession to political realities of the moment. However, the revealed statement was subsequently applied to monotheists, refusing to accept the legitimacy of the prophet's mission, namely Christians and Jews. Other verses in the Quran quoted by modern Muslim scholars to stress the inherent toleration of Islam especially Muslim scholars addressing a Western world fearing militant Islamic revival, are Quran 109 to 106, the surah or segment of Muslim scripture entitled Al-Kafirun, the unbelievers. 
The text reads, O ye unbelievers, I will not worship what you worship, nor will you worship what I worship, nor do I worship what you worship in the past, nor do you worship what I will worship. And then the off-quoted line, you have your religion and I have mine. Now these verses are currently cited to exemplify a live and let live attitude which Islam allegedly has always called for with regard to other religions. Certainly taking at least value, a modern reader could easily conclude from the line, Akumbinukumuridini, you have religion, your religion and I have mine, that Muslim scripture, at least in this surah, speaks to a kind of tolerance trumpeted by liberal forces in the democratic societies of the West. This very surah was in fact cited by a leading Muslim spokesman in the United States shortly after the events of 9-11 in an attempt to promote Islam as a tolerant religion so as to diffuse the anticipated negative backlash against Americans of the Islamic faith. But these verses also have an earlier context and also an extensive 1300-year commentary that offers a rather different gloss on Quran 109, 1 to 6, and what it meant at an earlier time and in a different world, and what it continues to mean to traditional Muslims in the Islamic heartland. Muslim and Western scholars are both agreed that these verses were originally uttered at a very early stage of the Prophet's career, a time when he felt it necessary to establish a safe space for himself in an environment that was anything but sympathetic to his religious views, namely the beginning of his mission in polytheist Mecca. Because the verses allowing non-believers license was in fact spoken by Muhammad and were thus God's word revealed by his prophet, they could hardly be removed from the holy text, but they could be subjected to inventive interpretation that contradicted the acceptance of the polytheists. The Muslim authorities urged that this conciliatory message in the Quran was contradicted by other subsequent revelations, and so they regarded it as an authentic revelation, but a revelation which was abrogated by the Prophet's later utterances, a reference to any number of verses that directly or indirectly enjoined the Muslims to turn and give battle to the unbelieving polytheists. The hermeneutic, or interpretive principle, in which the message of later surahs abrogated early revelation in Arabic, Nasih Mansur, was an accepted technique of Quran commentary. We might then ask how applying the principle of abrogation to the unbelievers, particularly the verse, you have your religion and I have mine, might have affected, if at all, subsequent Muslim attitudes and behavior towards Jews. Jews may have denied from the outset the Prophet's legitimacy, and they may have rejected his mission, but as did the Muslims, they believed in the one true God. In that sense, the original verses of the unbelievers could hardly have referred to Jews in the same way it spoke to the idol-worshipping Meccans. Once again, the Muslim commentators showed their interpretive dexterity while originally signifying the polytheists who would not uh, except monotheism, and therefore worthy of being subjected by force, the unbelievers later was understood by Muslim scholars to refer to Jews and also to Christians. That being the case, the verse could be applied to include blameworthy Jews of ancient times, the Israelites who disobeyed Moses and killed their own prophets, in this case a reference to Jesus by way of the New Testament, by extension, it could be applied as well to Jews who rejected Muhammad and his mission. However, current Muslims facing Western audiences wish to interpret, you have religion and I have mine, the verse hardly signified to traditional Muslims a blanket acceptance of others and their religious views and behavior, including monotheists who deliberately turned against their own traditions, as in the past, and deliberately rejected Muhammad and his message. Quite the opposite, when commentators explicitly state the verse does not prohibit engaging religious warfare with unbelievers, some authorities explicitly mention Muhammad's Jewish opponents and draw attention to the Jews of the time by name. These negative responses to Jews and Judaism may be the cause of traditional readings of 
the, the case in traditional readings of the Quran, the ultimate source of authority for believing Muslims. It is possible, however, for new readings of scripture to replace those of old. I refer to readings that might create a climate of greater tolerance, including perhaps Jewish-Muslim relations in the current world. That is, reading your, have your religion and I have mine as a call for a live and let live attitude among Muslims and Jews, and indeed Muslims and other non-believers. A number of Muslim reformers educated in the West and familiar with Western ideals emanating from the European Enlightenment have criticized the rigidity of Islamic orthodoxy, medieval as well as modern, and have sought to move beyond the literal sense of Muslim scripture and its commentary and what they see as the interpretive limits set by orthodox Muslim authorities. <clears throat> like the traditionalists, they read the Quran as a God-given document that was revealed in time and place, but as God's word is eternal and changing times demand fresh patterns of behavior, they insist that its passages can and must be massaged to recover what one reformer calls the ethical legal principles embodied in the text, principles that may serve as a guide for human behavior in modern times. For example, as a spur to improve relations between different factions of Muslims and also with the unbelievers. Some Muslim reformers, largely situated in the West, have invoked the Quran, albeit often very indirectly, to trumpet the need for dialogue with the other. They call for a respectful exchange of ideas, leading to a sense of pluralism, and also call for freedom in the sense of living a life free of coercion. Some reformers also stress the equality for women. But the Arabic vocabulary they employ to express these liberal concepts when found in the Quran and in classical Arabic sources does not suggest the meaning that the reformers seek. That is to say, the values the reformers espouse are more easily traced to the universal rights of man declared by European Enlightenment thinkers than the Prophet Muhammad's declarations in 7th century Arabia. Now, the conservative sheikhs and imams, those religious authorities who command the allegiance of the vast majority of Muslims and are, needless to say, intimately familiar with the text of the Quran, its vast commentary, and Islamic law and tradition, draw rather different conclusions as to the meaning of the Prophet's revelations, a meaning which is more consistent with the literal meaning of the Arabic text and its numerous commentaries. Moreover, the conservatives who now appear regularly on television and have talk and radio shows and internet chat rooms do not address an audience of Muslims that waxes philosophical. Rather, they give direct and clear answers to pragmatic concerns of Muslims wishing to fulfill God's command. Outside of certain intellectual circles, the Islamists or more traditional Muslim authorities have thus far emerged victorious over Western-oriented reformers who express their ideas in philosophically abstract English and French. All this does not bode well for those who proclaim the end of ideology and the emergence of a global village embracing all the peoples of humankind, people sharing universal values based on achieving a life free of unpowered prostitution and war. In sum, a life of, a life of tolerance based on mutual understanding with our shared values. Now, I trust this is not a particularly uh, happy message to uh, to present, but it's probably a lot happier than some of the other messages <laughs> that were sent before. Thank you very much. Our third paper of the afternoon will be presented by Professor Mayor Bitfan. It is Anti Semitism in Iran Continuities and Changes. Okay, first I want to thank uh, Charles for inviting me, and I also want to thank the audience, those who survived until now, for your perseverance. <laughs> and I know what it means to be the last speaker who stands before you in dinner. Uh, in recent years, Iran has taken the lead among the Indian states in its calls for the elimination of the state of Israel, in, in uh, espousing anti-Semitism as an official state policy. Iranian spokesman, has, uh, as well as Western apologies for the UN regime, 
uh, often claim that Iran distinguishes between Zionism and uh, or Israel and between Jews and Judaism, and that uh, such uh, statements are merely anti-Zionist and are therefore perfectly legitimate. However, as I intend to show, Iran does not differentiate between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism, nor is this animosity uh, confined to one eccentric or particularly radical or uh, hardline president. Rather, it is a much broader phenomenon shared by Iran's political, religious, and parts of its cultural elites. Moreover, it has acquired in recent years several new and disturbing uh, attributes. I want to start here uh, with a very brief historical survey, I will not repeat what Daniel Zadig has said, uh, of uh, anti-Semitism in Iran in order to highlight uh, the new situation. Now, the Jewish community in Iran is one of the oldest in the Middle East, and many Iranians uh, point to the famous declaration of Cyrus the Great in the 6th century BCE you know, to demonstrate Iran's openness to minorities and to Jews in particular. Yet, there is a gap between Cyrus and today, uh, ever since Iran has become a Shi'i state, following the unifica its unification by the Safavids in 1501, it has, be it has become the most intolerant Muslim state of the Jews. Iran was the only Muslim country that experienced mass forced conversions of Jews, although some uh, scholars argue that these forced conversions, conversions did not target uh, solely the Jews, uh, but other religious minorities as well as part of Safavid efforts to consolidate the cohesion of Iranian society. While it is true, still there was a difference between Iranian policy toward Jews and toward Armenians who were much uh, uh, given preference by the Safavids uh, during those days. Now, these anti-Jewish uh, traits continued well into the 19th century and under the Qajar dynasties, and since it was analyzed by the Nelsenik both in his book and lecture, I will not uh, repeat them. Uh, one implement this was uh, Shi uh, anti-Judaism in the 19th century emphasized uh, religious uh, element, uh, uh, attitude. And a new element, which also Daniel Zadik mentioned, was the appearance in the late 19th century, uh, uh, 20th century, of the importation of European racist ideology, uh, especially the element of Aryan superiority, which uh, some European nationalists uh, uh, liked very much, including uh, Reza Shah of, of uh, Iran. However, the reign of his son, Muhammad Reza Shah, was the golden era uh, of Iranian Jewry, which reached unprecedented achievements, both intellectually and materially. It was also a period of extensive Iranian-Israeli economic, military, and strategic cooperation. The turning point here, however, is the 1960s. Uh, uh, which marks the rise of anti-Semitism due to the growing rift between the Shah and the Islamic opposition, which exacerbated Iranian Islamic animosity toward Israel for its alliance uh, with the Shah and for its perceived essence as a Western imperialist base set up in order to oppress the Muslims. It was Ayatollah Khomeini who emerged in 1963 as, as, the, as the leader of the Islamist opposition to the Shah, who incorporated anti-Semitism with his overall political doctrine. Therefore, following the 1979 revolution and the emergence of the clergy under Khomeini's leadership as the new rulers of Iran, anti-Semitism became an integral component of the regime's ideology and political discourse. What then are the new salient features of Iranian anti-Semitism in, in, uh, in recent times? And here, uh, I want to emphasize or focus on four elements. One is the modern nature of this anti-Semitism and the fusion of traditional and modern elements. The second is official state sponsorship. Third is the efforts of pseudo-academization of anti-Semitism. And fourth, Holocaust denial which ties all of these things together. Now, the modern nature of present-day Iranian anti-Semitism is apparent both in media and the message. Pre-modern anti-Judaism was led by a powerful clerical establishment against the small and defenseless Jewish minority in Iran, with the intention of eventually converting them to Islam. It was manifested in various legal and social restrictions against Jews and was disseminated through anti-Jewish statements and interpretations in Islam of Islamic legal writings, as well as in religious polemics against Judaism. Nowadays, Iranian Jews are not a target of anti-Semitism. Anti 
In fact, they enjoy tolerance, though not full legal uh, equality, in order to show that under the benevolent rule of Islam, Jews can live peacefully. And therefore, there is no need for, for Zionism, for the political manifestation of Judaism. The target today of, of Iran anti-Semitism are the Jewish people as a group, as well as Jewish culture and Jewish history, and in particular, again, the political manifestation of Judaism, that is Zionism. In the past, anti-Jewish attitudes carried out a distinct Shi'i nature, manifested in emphasis, if not, if not obsession, with the, with the impurity, the jasat of the Jews. Khomeini himself, in his earlier books, before 1960, or his, in, his, in one of his earlier early books, Tawzih uh, al-Masail, that is clarification of questions, emphasized in the Shi doctrine of the ritual impurity of unbelievers. Today, the scope of anti-Semitic activity may be unique, unique to Iran, but the content is shared by all Islamic movements in the region and is clearly influenced by Sunni uh, movements as well as by Arab countries. Thus, for instance, the Najasat issue, the impurity of the Jews, has been dropped completely today. The new approach fuses anti-Jewish elements from the Quran and early Islamic tradition together with those of modern Western anti-Semitism. It is based on the belief in Jewish enmity toward Islam from its inception and in the association of the Jews and Zionism with the Western cultural challenge and threat to Islam as a religion, identity, and culture. In other words, it reflects the anger of the Muslims of the Muslim world vis-à-vis -vis the West and the crisis of Islam in the modern period. It stems from the widespread feelings of, of a threatened Islam, which is a subject of a Western uh, economic and political domination, and whose identity and culture are under attack by Western civilization. Islamic fundamentalism at large, Shi and Sunni, requires the existence of a conspiracy in order to find some external reason for Muslim weakness and dependence. Thus, according to Khomeini, the Jews and Christians conspired against Islam in the modern world, in the modern period. The Jews joined hands with other groups that were even more satanic than them, than themselves, according to Khomeini, in order to facilitate the imperialist penetration of Muslim countries. Their main goal, Khomeini says, was the extirpation of Islam since, since Islamic ordinances were the main obstacle in the path of their materialistic ambitions. In addition, the West, consisting of Jews and Christian, uh, of Jewish and Christian elements, resists the righteous cause of Islam to expand to the four corners of the globe. Linking Judaism and Zionism, Khomeini maintained that that the most overt manifestation of, of Jewish-Christian conspiracy against Islam was the establishment of Israel by Western imperialism in order to oppress the Muslims. Both Khomeini and his successor as Supreme Leader, that is Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, stated that the occupation of Palestine by the Jews is part of a satanic design by the world domineering powers, that is, uh, the West, perpetrated by the British in the past and being carried today by, uh, carried out today by the, U by the U.S. in order to weaken the solidarity of the Islamic world and to sow the seeds of disunity among Muslims. One of the major features of Islamism is the quest of authenticity or the redefinition of Muslim identity, which intensified the uncritical and totalistic reading of earlier Islamic history. Such a reading led to the reopening and the need to reset to settle once again various so-called historical accounts which Islam had had with other religious and ideologies. This reading uh, revived medieval polemics with the Jews and highlighted the sins and evils uh, evil that which the Jews had committed against the Muslims since the early days of Islam. Khomeini, for instance, charges in the first page of his most important political uh, uh, book, The Light of Fakir, or The uh, Ruling of the Jews, he starts in the first page that from the very beginning, Islam was afflicted by the Jews, for it was they who had established anti-Islamic propaganda and engaged in various strategies uh, against Muslims. Following this lead, Iranian religious and scholars and scholarly journals have published in recent years dozens of articles 
which discuss various aspects of supposed Jewish animosity and activities against the Prophet Muhammad. Typical of Islamic polemics in general, and this is something which uh, Professor Lassner has showed in his earlier books, the past and the present are inextricably linked together. Thus, Ayatollah Imam Kashani, a member of the powerful Council of Guardians, created a direct link between present-day Israeli policies and Jewish atrocities against the Muslims carried out in the first century of expression of the fusion uh, between past and present. Uh, uh, past and present is the result to early Arab or Iranian history. Again, the episode which the Nazi mentioned, therefore I will uh, uh, skip. A major, a major modern feature of Iran anti-Semitism is the borrowing of Western motifs. While the Islamic regime in Iran usually rejects Western cultural influence as an anathema to authentic Islamic culture, it has not hesitated to borrow anti-Zionist and anti-Jewish themes from the same West in the services of its cause. And again, the most related example, and the Gelsadik mentioned it, is the publication, publication of the Protocols of the Zion uh, uh, by the Iran government. Now, another example is the borrowing of the blood libel, which was mentioned here today, uh, to use against the Jews in modern time. A second new feature of Iranian anti-Semitism is the central role of the state in promoting it through its various organs. Popular view in the West focuses on Ahmadinejad's declarations, but in reality, all Iranian leaders take part in disseminating anti-Semitism. To cite just one example, Ayatollah Muhammad Taki Mesbah Yazdi, the man who is widely regarded as the great eminence of the, behind the ultra-conservative faction in Iranian politics today, stated recently that the majority of the centers of corruption in the world belong to Jews and Zionists. They try to corrupt the, uh, the others and thus rule the world. And he added that the Jews are the most corrupt in the world. You don't, you can, you don't find such tribe in any other nation, country, or region. Jews are the most seditious group among all human beings, and they will not leave Muslims alone until they destroy Islam. The official state media is a major instrument in the dissemination of, of anti-Semitism. Iran and TV, for instance, regularly broadcast doc documentaries and, and drama shows based on the protocols of the elders of Zion. It also accuses the Jews of being involved in the September in the, the September 11th attack on the US. And they could go on and on and on with such examples. The Iranian government has also mobilized academics to the anti-Jewish agenda in order to endow it with a pseudo-scholarly weight and respectability. For instance, Abdullah Shahabazi, the former head of the state-run political studies and research institute, and who is a well-known historian in Iran, has published over the last decade a five-volume five study uh, titled, this is his title, uh, English title, not mine, The Jews and Parsi Plutocrats, British Imperialism and Iran, which con contains conspiratorial anti-Jewish themes and has been, uplo uh, been uploaded in his uh, website. You can, you can read it if you want. Also, the Historical Studies Quarterly, uh, which is published by this center, again, this is an official state center, devoted the entire fall 2006 edition to Holocaust denial, including articles such as Did Six Million People Really Die? and Truth Burning uh, Furnaces. Since 2007, more than 10 books have been published in Iran engaging Holocaust denial, while other pseudo scholarly books articles and studies continuously uncover and analyze the history of Jews and Zionism in anti-Semitic fashion. Iranian academics have also appeared on state TV explaining in detail how Jewish rabbis in Europe used to kill babies and take their blood for ritual purposes. We saw this morning. A certain professor, Hashemadullah Kanbari, characterized in a TV interview the Jews as a sub subversive element in human history and as a, as a satanic <coughs> and anti-human uh, creatures. He further described the Jews as the source of all corrupt traits in humanity. The political goal behind this pseudo-scholarly effort is indicated in one of Shah Abbasi's new books, which is called The Beginning and End of the Children of Israel. Finally, Holocaust denial brings together all, all the themes which I talked about. Iranian leaders have viewed the Holocaust as a myth invented to create a guilt complex in the West and forge a sympathetic public opinion in support of the establishment of the State of Israel. They argue that without the Holocaust, Israel might not have existed at all. Supreme Leader Khamenei, before Ahmadinejad was elected, 
set, set this, line, uh, uh, this uh, uh, line in a speech made in April 2001, which maintained, which maintained that the Zionists had exaggerated Nazi crimes against European Jewry in order to solicit international support for the establishment of the Zionist entity in 1948. Hence, the premise which stood be, stands behind the denial was, was that the refutation of, of this lie would undermine Israel's leg legitimacy uh, and eventually uh, would bring its uh, collapse. The instrumentalist <coughs> usage of Iran Holocaust uh, denial is also evident in the frequent comparison by Iranian officials uh, 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 and media between Zionism and Nazism and between the Gestapo-like policies of Israel and those of Hitler and by super the way, also the instrumentalization because sometimes they deny the Holocaust and occasionally they accuse the Zionist movement of collaborating with the Nazis in killing the Jews. Holocaust denial is in fact anti-Semitism disguised as anti-Zionism. To cite just one example, former president and current, current head of Iran's Assembly of Experts, Ali Akbar Hashemir Sanjani, who was, until recently, the second most powerful person in the Iran regime, who, and who is often hailed as a moderate in, in Iran politics, compared to Ahmadinejad as a moderate, uh, explained in a speech uh, commemorating Jerusalem Day in October 2007 that the Nazis' first objective was to free Europe from the evils of Zionism, and that this was justifiable because the Zionists, who constituted a strong political party in Europe, caused much, caused much disorder there. Since the Zionists had a lot of property and controlled an empire of propaganda, they made European governments helpless. And what Hitler and the Nazis did to the Jews of Europe, he added, was partly due to these circumstances which are due, uh, uh, with the Jews. They wanted to expel the Zionists from Europe because they always had this great, uh, the Zionists were such a great menace uh, to the governments there, uh, there. The first goal was to save Europe from the evils of Zionism, and in this way, uh, they have been relatively, relatively successful. In using the pretext of uh, Zionist fabrication of the Holocaust, Iran distorts and, and denies Jewish history and deprives the Jews of their human dignity by pre presenting the worst tra tragedy as a scam, even though both have nothing to do with the Zionism and Israel per se. The very claim of Zionist invention of the Holocaust appeals to strong sentiments of existing both in European and Middle Eastern anti-Semitism that emphasizes Jewish unscrupulous mani mani machinations in order to advance uh, illegitimate and immoral goals, mainly financial extortion. It aims at demolishing the legitimacy of the Jewish state, which they claim is based on, on the Holocaust myth. As such, it is in tune with anti-Jewish and anti-Zionist sentiments in Europe, which argue that the Jews had forfeited their right or the status of victims by victimizing the Palestinians, and that Israel does not have the right to exist because the human price of its existence is too high. Now, while Iran professes to be anti-Nazi, both Holocaust denial and the equation of Zionism with and the Nazis minimizes the extent and depth of Nazi evil and brutality, thereby serving the cause of Western neo-Nazis and other anti-Semites. In a similar vein, the, the, the vilification of Zionists and, and, as Nazis is intended to, to humiliate the Jews as the, uh, as the most sensitive and painful feeling by, by equating them with their worst uh, uh, tormentors. Moreover, not only does it deprive the Jews of their dignity and transforms the victims into the perpetrators of, of, the, of the crime, it threatens the Jews with the same ultimate fate of the Nazis, that is uh, destruction. To conclude, anti-Semitism in Iran has undergone significant changes in recent decades, but unfortunately, it is, it is in the wrong direction. Thank you very much. I'm not sure, Charles, do we have time for questions or have we uh, run over? We are, we are over, so thank you very much for your participation. And thank you.